Good morning, family. This is kind of weird, isn't it? See me with this mask on? I'm gonna leave it on for just a couple of seconds. I'll take it off here in a second. But I wanna kind of stress a point. This mask has nothing to do with fear. This mask is not me being something following blindly what has been said. This mask is about my love for you and about respect for those who are around me. I am exposed to people. And so this mask helps decrease what I may be spreading. We request that you respect everyone here as we should as Christians, looking out for the betterment of other people to keep them healthy and to keep them well and to set that example for the world around us. And we'll maintain these masks during our worship services. There may have been a little bit of confusion previously as I discussed the Arkansas Department of Health guidelines. And there's a strong encouragement very strong encouragement for those who are, have health underlying health conditions as outlined on those guidelines. Won't go through that again. And those who are older, 65 and older is the day or the age we pick, that stay home and do this online. And we are going to continue to have an online worship option, not only for y'all, but also for people who have been mentioned in prayer today. Those who are in the healthcare field who either are positive and can't come to our services or those who don't feel like it's safe for them because they may expose other people as well. And we're gonna keep this service going online for quite some time as an option. We love you all. We really want everybody here. We really wanna pull these masks off, throw them away, put our arms around you, hug you, and give you a handshake. But again, out of caution, out of respect, and out of our concern for you, we're gonna refrain from that for a little while. Again, things when you come back on the 31st are gonna be just a little bit different because of that. But I think over the past nine weeks or so, we have shown that we are resilient, that we can do different okay. And there are lots of emotions right now. There's anger, there's fear, there's confusion. But remember, we serve a God of peace, a God of order, not a God of chaos. So we look forward to seeing you on the 31st. There will be a sign up option uh, on our website. And if you cannot or don't have access to uh, the internet, or if you don't have an email address, call uh, LaVon Davis in our church office and she can get that registered for you. Uh, I think once you register, you'll get a confirmation email. Just because of physical constraints here, we have a limited number of seating, but also we wanna have a record of who is here so that if you do test positive and we have to let people know who has been sick, we can do that, and we can do that good contact tracing as it's known. Um, again, we look forward to seeing you here if you're able to come, if it's safe for you to come, and you feel comfortable to come. But again, we understand that some of you cannot. You may have a lot of kids that are under, they're little, and hard to keep them corralled. And again, we're trying to maintain that social distancing issue. And they may be hard to corral, and we understand that. We're not gonna accuse you of backsliding, where you're not gonna get an extra special visit from the elders, you'll just get a regular front porch visit from us. We miss you guys, we look forward to seeing you, and we look forward to the world spinning once again, and us being able to hug each other. Thank you. So welcome to our online services here at Valley View. This, I guess, will be the last time uh, that we do it this way, and I'm so grateful for so many who've made this possible, this uncertainty time, this limbo time, was be able, we were able to bridge that because of Matthew Walton, who's behind the camera, but everybody knows him by now. He's taken every Friday and Saturday for the last uh, eight, nine, ten weeks uh, to be getting this thing ready so that it would bless us. And so we owe him a great big uh, thank you. And we're going to do a standing ovation when we get back together for that. And he thinks I'm kidding. There are a, a few greetings uh, to uh, that you'll see here in just a moment, but I want to be sure that you know that this afternoon, Sunday at three o'clock, we're going to start a special Valley View Church of Christ parade. It's going to start at the ASU parking lot across uh, from Johnson Avenue, across from McDonald's, uh, and, and you'll be given a sheet that says all uh, the places where we will uh, do a drive-by honking now, uh, a long, steady honk is like uh, something like you're agitated or you're conveying your disapproval. Don't do that. These are little light, friendly honks that we will be giving to different people. Uh, more than a dozen homes you're going to go by as you 
make the parade route. Just give you some things. Uh, slowly drive by, a wave, give a nice... They, they, most of them will not be outside. Uh, but it will mean different things at different places. Like, for instance, um, uh, at Bill Berry, uh, he'll be out on his uh, balcony thing outside. And a, a little honk is a howdy is all it means there. But John Pruitt, however, is at Hospice House. And uh, when I mentioned this to him, it was very uncharacteristic of him. He goes to the morning service, early service, I should say, and, and very few people really know him other than the early service people, and yet he's family. And I shared with him this idea, and he got uh, pretty emotional and said, I would like that. I would be honored. And I knew then that we had to do this, so we're going to go by there, and that honk is going to be goodbye. It's the last, uh, last time most of us will, will see him. Uh, but there are others. Um, we're going to say congratulations, Dakota Ray Brown. We're going to go by the Browns' house uh, on um, High Hill or Hilltop, something like that. Uh, Trent Branscombe, we're just going to say, hey, we're here. We're thinking about you. Um, Ann Dawson uh, fell, broke a hip a couple weeks ago. Bennett and Compass called her a time or two, and she says, I am going crazy. There is nobody let in here. And I need to see people. But, she told me, I haven't been to the beauty shop in three weeks, so no one can see me. So uh, we're going to go by her house and honk, make sure she does not, uh, that we do not see her, but she does see us. That's the only way um, to do that uh, without getting her very upset, and you don't want Ann Dawson mad at you. Dana Lands, we're going to go by her house. Uh, She works really hard at the hospital, got COVID that way. She's on house arrest or whatever they call that, right, with her whole family. And we can't really do much for them, but we can go by and honk and just say we're with you in this and we're praying for you. Uh, also on the list, of course, um, there toward the end, for those who stick it out to the end, Gail Holder will be uh, uh, among the last and we'll honk, just say we're praying for you. And then the very last one will be a birthday honk for Josie Wydick. So, I mean, 18th birthday, not many, pe- not many people can say they were honked at by a I don't know, 50 people, that would be a great thing. Then if you just want to be together, grab a sack lunch and a drive through somewhere and go back up the church building. Let's just hang out in each other's trunks, uh, observing social distance. I'm telling you, this is just going to be fun. It's just going to be a fun time to go around. You're going to see lots of people and uh, be together as you do that. I just want to encourage you if you can at all. And of course, if it's just horrendous rain and storm, we won't do it, but uh, I hope it holds off that way. A couple of things I noticed this week. I went to see Ann Jones, but didn't catch her at home. Uh, But I noticed this sign at her house. You're going to see it in the picture on the screen. And here's what it says, in case you can't see it. Friends are always welcome. Relatives are by appointment only. I love that. I thought that was beautiful. Uh, That's not for my mother-in-law. I'm just saying saying that that relates to her. Also at Hospice House, visiting uh, John Pruitt, I was not allowed in the room just yet. So I was looking at the hall, and there was this great artwork. You're going to see it on the screen, too couple of hands, and the name of it is New Wings. And I was just mesmerized by the look and what it means. And I looked down in the corner, and it said the artist was Clay Hearn, which is one of our members. Um, And I just loved it, and I had to take a picture of it and just brag on him. So when somebody does something like this. Well, next Sunday should mark our time back at the building. It's very strange. You know, we've been at church here for a number of weeks for years. We never missed a Sunday for years. We had a routine. Everybody can think back in their minds exactly how we did things. But now that we've been out, I'm not even sure how the service is going to go. I don't know the way it's going to work. But we want you to be there if you can be there. Eight, ten, or five, right? And that's Randy's explained that already. You need to sign up if you're going to do this. You need to register online. Just let her know or or call LaVon if you absolutely have to and she'll... She'll put you on there, but it's vvcoc.org slash return. You'll see that on the screen as well. Be sure to let us know which one you're at. That There's a lot of things that that does, but just it reserves your spot and allows us not to be overcrowded so that we can observe this social distance. Enjoy the few greetings for a moment. Uh, Graham Horner is going to bring us back together with a song, and then a couple of guys are going to be doing our scripture reading. I really believe you'll do a double take uh, as you hear scripture read. And then uh, we'll get to our passage. Hi, everyone. I'm Zach. I'm Ashley. I'm Kate. I'm Kaylin. I'm Camden. And we're the Holcombs. Camden, what do you miss from Valley View? I miss all my friends.
friends. I miss Mr. Jeff giving out Tic Tacs and the yummy food at Potlucks. I miss Sunday Night Children's Bible Hour, Sally and Elliot, and the youth group. I miss the youth group, anything related to the youth group, really. All my friends, the activities, the nieces, and Emerson. I miss coming together as a, as a group, but especially I miss the, the times that we fellowship outside of church where we're, we are able to share meals or share, share activities. And those are things that we are missing from our everyday life. Yes, I agree. I miss the fellowship the most. Uh, I miss the fellowship in the building with all of you. I miss the fellowship outside when we share many meals with others. I miss coming together as a family to worship um, with all of you and then sharing in that experience and with communion. Uh, I miss sitting behind the hoes and seeing their family and admiring their marriage and and just I miss the encouragement that I get from being with all of you guys and um, I really really can't wait to be back I think we all agree we really cannot wait to be back with you guys and to worship and fellowship with you we miss you and we love you all can't wait to see you guys again hey church family Chris Bridget <laughs> Corbin and Ellie here. Uh, we just want to say that we miss seeing everyone. Uh, we're eager to get back to church to uh, be with everyone and worship together. And we can't wait until that day comes. Ellie, what do you miss? Um, I miss going to church every Sunday and Wednesday and seeing my friends and learning those Bible lessons in the Bible. Right. Corbin, what do you miss? Corbin, what do you uh, miss about church? Uh, school. School. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're eager to get back, and we hope to see everyone soon. See y'all again soon. Bye-bye. Hi, everyone. It's Janine. I just wanted to say that I'm, like many of you are, too, I'm missing you all. And even though I may not see you every Sunday or Wednesday, um, I just miss seeing you across the way. I miss hearing our voices as we sing together. I miss the prayers. Um, just that feeling of love and support when you walk in. I'm looking forward to whenever we can get back together. And I know it's going to be a new normal, but I'm hoping it's going to be a new and improved normal. I hope you're all taking care of yourselves and finding the blessings in the situation as hard as it is, but there are some blessings in all of this. Uh, if I could take just a moment just to do a shout out to my students. Um, I was doubly blessed by being getting to see you at school and then getting to see you at church. And now I'm not getting to do either and I don't like it. Um, I miss seeing you and I hope you're all doing well. And hopefully I get to see you soon. I just hope everyone takes care and I look forward to when we can see each other again. Yeah. Hey, everybody. We're uh, we're just chilling at home like everybody else, and uh, we just wanted to say that we uh, really miss everybody, uh, especially our teenagers. It was crazy. We went from seeing them like two or three times a week or more to nothing, uh, and now we've kind of got some some news that all of our activities have been canceled uh, for the summer. So we're coming up with some great activities. Our interns actually come next week. They're going to be in the services next week. Pretty excited about that. So are, our so are a lot of our teenagers. Uh, and I, I just can't wait to get back and see everybody. It's going, to be, it's going to be incredible when we're able to actually be back and see each other. Uh, I can't wait to give somebody a hug. <laughs> um, like Michael, I'm majorly missing... <laughs> our teenagers and sitting with them at church and eating with them before church and um, having devos with them and having them in our house and we're missing all of our friends very dearly and probably the thing I miss most is um, singing in our worship service um, that's been a huge void I mean even though we're singing here there's just something about sitting by your brothers and sisters in Christ and being encouraged um, by hearing all of their voices, praising God at the same time that you are. Um, and I know for a fact that Emerson is missing 
Bible class, even though she just threw her Bible on the ground twice, <laughs> <laughs> she, we've been singing Pat the Bible and Jesus Loves Me a whole lot lately. And I know she's missing her Bible class teachers and her sweet friends. Um, there, Bible. We, she has learned how to pray and she has to pray a whole lot. <laughs> so we, we pray like 150 times a day now. <laughs> um, and we're doing lots of Pat in the Bible. Um, but we can't wait to be back with our church family. Thanks for everything you are doing for each other. Uh, it's a really cool deal through all this, seeing all the things on Facebook, emails and everything about the great stuff that y'all are doing in the community with each other, with our family, uh, delivering cookies. It's just a really cool thing to read about and see. So keep that up. We miss y'all so much. You say bye-bye? Say bye-bye. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, we're the Nix family. I'm Matt. This is Layla, and that's Sawyer, and Carla. And uh, we just wanted to say we're ready to be back to church. We miss our friends. We miss our brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, I especially miss watching the kids play with each other. Um, I miss talking with people in class, and I really miss um, being in church and actually hearing uh, everybody sing with one another best we can do on YouTube and singing with our own families and having the opportunities to hear the kids sing or lead one for us, I definitely miss that the most. Uh, Layla, do you miss anything about church? Lessons not the same without Miss Risa. And all my other teachers. There you go. All my other teachers. Yes. I miss the feeling of family and the fellowship. I would say I miss even shushing my children during church, but I still have to do that at home. Um, but it's comforting to know that some things stay the same. I miss seeing friends. I miss seeing the delight on the faces of my children and other people's children because they're just so excited to be there. I miss Sunday night dinners with friends and overall we're just very excited to get back to church. All right, well, we look forward to seeing you all in a few weeks. Bye. 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 Hi Valley View family, it's the Fitz family, and we're going to tell you a little bit about what we miss about being in church with our Valley View family. Um, mostly I miss the hugs from Mr. Terry and Mr. Randy as we walk in, seeing everybody, hugs in general from the people that know us the most, the ones that know when we're happy, when we're sad, when something's going on. So our church family, um, I miss our college kids, we do get to see a few of them here and there at drive-throughs and whatever, but I really miss getting to see them and hang out, know what's going on in their life. With graduations, we've gotten to miss so much in their lives the past few weeks that we, we thought we would get to be part of and we haven't. Um, and mostly just our friends. I mean, I guess I miss Spencer's preaching a little bit, but not really. Um, so mostly our friends and family. Ella? I miss all of our friends and family. Um, I just miss like leading singing in front of everybody and hearing all the commotion about there's a stirring and <laughs> hearing Spencer gripe about it and stuff. It's a lot of fun. I miss everything with everybody. We have a great church family. We have wonderful people that are there. I miss Paul hollering at people and talking to people in the, in the lobby. The people he doesn't know he calls Princess. Um, I miss our college kiddos. We do our very best to keep in touch with them. Um, Miss Miss Wanda and Mr. Harold, they're wonderful people, good influences on us. Um, I don't miss Spencer's preaching, <laughs> and as soon as church gets back and we can get these masks off, there will be a stirring. So we miss you all, love you a bunch, and we'll see you soon. Bye. Happy Memorial Day. Hey, Bell of you. Hope y'all are doing well um, and staying safe. Uh, you know, with the new normal comes a new hairdo. 
I've kind of just let myself go, let it grow out. I'm feeling good about it. Um, but I do have a haircut appointment here in a couple of weeks. I may have to reevaluate some stuff, but there's so many people at Value View with mullets. I just kind of feel like I fit in now. Um, but seriously, I just wanted to let y'all know that um, miss y'all, respect and love y'all. Um, I think that community is very, very important. Um, I think that we are the product of those with whom we surround ourselves. And I think that I'm not at my best if I'm not around y'all. Uh, also studies have shown that people live longer if they attend church services regularly. And I think that a big part of that is community, interpersonal contact, and uh, a sense of belonging. So the sooner we can get back together, the better. I think we'll all be happier and healthier. Um, so I look forward to seeing y'all next week. Um, by the way, this is what I really, oh, this is what I look like without the wig, but Olivia says I look more attractive with it. So maybe I'll just, just keep it on for a little bit. See y'all. How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that he should give his only son to make a wretch's treasure. How great the pain of searing loss. The father turns his face away as wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to Behold the man upon a cross, my sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there. No power, no wisdom, but I will boast in Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer, but this I know with all my heart. His wounds have paid my ransom, but this I know with all my heart. His wounds have paid my ransom. Today we'll be reading Haggai chapter 1, verse 2 through 9. This is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the Lord's house. Then the word of the Lord came through. The prophet Haggai, is it, is, is it a time for you yourself to be living in your paneled houses while, while this house remains a ruin? Now this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to, to your way you have planted much but harvest little you eat but but never have enough you drink but never have your fill you put on clothes but are not warm you earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. Go up into the mountains and bring down timber and build my house so that I may take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. You 
you expected much, but see, it turned out to be a little. What you brought home, I blew away. Why, declare, why, declares the Lord Almighty, because of my house, which remains a ruin while each of you is busy with your own houses. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so. We really need to get back together soon, really do. That just sounds so weird alone. Uh, the final pandemic passage, this is our last chance. I've never heard anyone giving a series of lessons on pandemic passages, right? Whoever would have envisioned doing this kind of thing. Uh, we're, we're now looking at the prospect of return. Captivity is when you're uh, being in a place where you, because you cannot be where you want to be. You're somewhere else. Uh, but even years before this captivity where they were not where they wanted to be, Isaiah forecasts that that time is going to be short. And uh, 70 years, uh, it's kind of short. But Isaiah even gives the name of the person. There's going to be someone God raises up to send his people back to the land of promise. Isaiah names him 100 plus years before he ever exists. It's pretty amazing. And then Ezra is the one who records it. It's in the time of Daniel. But I want to read this to you. This is what broke the captivity and allowed the people to think about returning back home. It's a man named Cyrus of the kingdom of Persia. Ezra chapter 1, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and he put it in writing. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth. And he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever is among you of all this people, may his God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. And let each survivor in whatever place he sojourns be assisted by the men of his place with silver and gold, with goods and with beasts, besides freewill offerings for the house of God that is in Jerusalem. Now just for your historic pleasure, there's also a picture on your screen of what is known as the Cyrus Cylinder. It does not mention Judah or Jerusalem, but this was a policy Cyrus did toward all kingdoms. Let them go back to their homes and they'll be easier to be held in subjection. And so there's a Cyrus Cylinder, it's in the British Museum, and it's one of these that lists, and actual, it is the actual thing he sent out it pertains to some other nation. But Cyrus did have this policy, and we hear about it in the book of Ezra. And so Israel is allowed to go back. The people are allowed to go back to Jerusalem, just like we're going to get to go back to some level of normalcy in the coming weeks. And my goal today is just to look at those post-exilic prophets and say, what did they have to say from God about the return? What were the concerns on God's heart for His people as they went back home? There's a couple fascinating things right at the forefront, and that's this. The return, just like the captivity, was incremental. It wasn't everybody at once. It was three waves. So we have Sheshbazar and Ezra uh, led 50,000 people to go back in the year 536. That's the first wave of people returning home. The second list, that's in Ezra 2, all those names, or the families. In 457, a few years later, Ezra himself took the second wave back, and that was 2,000 more people. And then there were several more uh, a few years later in 445 when Nehemiah returned with a group. This was not a single mass return. And you can imagine what that would have been like to go to a place that you have to completely rebuild and you have all these masses of people. They just couldn't handle that. And I'm looking at the way we're having to do this. I envisioned this weeks ago as what a celebration. We finally get to the end of this and we all get to come together. And then I'm realizing, of course, 
That's not how it's going to happen. It's going to be very incremental. That's kind of, that's kind of handy, really. Let's suppose that during this, this time that you've been able to reflect on your life and you realize there's certain changes that you need to take place, but all of a sudden everything is lifted and everything goes back to normal and all these activities and all these things happen at once and you're overwhelmed and you're swept away in this river of activity and suddenly everything that you learned is washed away. This allows you to slowly and incrementally get used to some changes that you want to see happen. I don't know if you noticed this, but sometimes we get to a point where we let life live us. The schedule gets set, and I just have to go through the motions. Now you've been given a reset. Now you've been given time to think. You don't have to go back to the same old enslavement to all those things. You get to choose. And no generation before us has had quite this opportunity like we do. You can think through what you involve yourself in. And so as you go back, you get to, you get to do it incrementally, slowly, so that you can handle this. Second thing, though, it's a red flag to me, and that is that some people liked it so much in Babylon they didn't want to go back. They love the goods and services of Babylon. They love the structure and the economy, and they love the whole, the whole order of life in Babylon. And they said, why do we want to go back home? Many of them never saw Jerusalem at all because they were born in captivity. They were just hearing stories from people. Many of these people just chose, I'm just going to stay and live here. I'm a little worried about that for us, to be honest with you. How nice has it been to get up at your own pace and go sit in a recliner and have your dog and your coffee and you watch worship and it's brought right to you. And Wednesday nights, if you do anything at all, it's a 15-minute devotional and that's it and it wraps it all up. And life get, all of a sudden, worship isn't inconvenient much at all. And the burden of fellowship. Can I tell you, I love fellowship and I... I sometimes resent it too. And as we've done this, is it possible that, man, I don't know, I want to go back? Strange. But as the people went back, they faced some great challenges and God issued them some prophets. And, and all I want to do is summarize what these prophets had to say. And there was three things, basically. Two prophets were dispatched at the beginning and near the beginning. And one of them, Ezra, is one of them. He gives some historical stuff in the first ch six chapters. But also there's Haggai and there's Zechariah who came around. And our reading for today, done by Brock and Bryant Malone so well, was from Haggai. And here's what happened, is the people went back to build the temple, right? They went back to build the house of God and start the worship and get the central... Uh, presence of God established for a, a community to be built upon. And guess what ended up happening? As they went back, they started building their homes. They started going to Lowe's and buying paneling and making decisions about floor coverings. They started signing Junior up for Little League and going to Little League practices, and the temple of God got put on the back burner. The very same reason they were sent into captivity and the, and the temple destroyed, they come back and they're all excited, but they get distracted. They get distracted with their enemies who don't want it rebuilt. They get distracted with their own private lives. I love the word paneling in the, war, in the book of Haggai. Who ever thought that they had paneling back then? They were wanting to set up their own houses and their own lives, and suddenly the temple took a back burner, right? It's so easy for that to happen. Do you think that's possible to happen? You think it's possible for us? I think of a time in Texas when I went to visit the prison ministry down there. It was very successful, a great program of prison ministry. I was just visiting, but as I go in there and I hear the preacher talk to these prisoners, and these prisoners were very educated. It's like they could outline what went wrong in their lives. They could tell you exactly the mistakes they made and how they need to correct it. They could even preach a great compelling sermon about the mistakes to avoid and, and how, to, how to live a righteous life. And they were behind bars and they didn't have all the temptations before them like they did in real life. And, and, and I, as we left, I asked the preacher, I said, are they, these guys are sharp. They know exactly what happened. They're going to get out and they're going to do well. And he said, I'll see most of them back here several times. They get back into that context again, and all this learning goes right out the door. And I'm just wondering if, 
If we've learned some things during this about our lives, about the pace of our lives, about our time together as family, about our time together in worship, and, and we, we look at this and we have time to analyze it, and we say, I want to do some things different. I want to do things with our time that's different. I want to do things with God that's different. But then all of a sudden we're allowed back and the return comes and the context comes back and suddenly all that's awash, right? Lesson number one, restore the worship. I'm not going to tell you that worship at home doesn't count. I believe it does. But I'm going to tell you worship at home is not the same. And it's not everything that God wants it to be when it involves full community. And for a time, we've had to suspend that, and that's fine. But when it comes back, we must restore worship as soon as we can. And that's what God's saying to His people. Restore worship quickly. Second message would be the second half of Ezra. And it is repent and recommit. Ezra then goes back himself. He's a historical record, the first six chapters, but now he personally goes back and he's a scribe. It says in chapter 7, verse 6, a scribe skilled in the law of Moses and the Lord, the God of Israel, that he had given. And then he said, my goal was to set, I set my heart to study the law of the Lord and do it and teach his statutes and rules in Israel. That was his task. And he wants to go back and he wants to teach the law. And when he goes back, what he realizes is the people are still worshiping, but they're not living the covenant. Setting up worship is relatively simple. Living out the covenant that worship symbolizes is not. And he goes and he watches the people and he realizes they look no different than the people of the land. They look like everybody else. They act like everybody else. They engage themselves in everything else. And it causes him to lament in chapter 8 and chapter 9. And there he is at the temple and he's, he's repenting before God out loud. And what's interesting is as he repents out loud at the things that he sees that are against the law of God, the people of God start coming to him and they start repenting. They hear what he's saying. They hear the words that he's discussing with them. And suddenly they start repenting. And what they realize is they've intermarried with people of the land and they've watered down their faith so bad that you can't identify a child of God from a regular person. Okay, restore the worship, that's good, but repent and recommit. We are gonna, we've got a restart here. We have got the blessing of a restart. Restart right. Make sure you commit to that covenant and say, I don't just want worship to be right. I want the accountability of the fellowship. I want everything to set me up to, to I want to, when, when school gets back, I want to start back faithful. When sports comes back, I want to engage faithfully. I want to make sure that my faith is completely engaged as much as that, as that worship is. And there's a third thing that happens. The third prophet is Nehemiah. He raises up walls. That's the reason he went. It's so disturbing to him to think that Jerusalem's out there vulnerable because it doesn't have a protective wall. For them, wall is identity. For them, wall is who, who is in and who is out. It is defense. It's all these things. And Nehemiah says, we've got to rebuild this wall, whatever it takes. And he has to crack a whip and he has to keep it before them because the people are distracted with other things. What exactly is a wall? I mean, we got Trump talking about a wall that makes everybody get all uptight, right? What exactly is a wall when it comes to spiritual things? I can see as I look at us, there's three walls that need to be built. One is the wall of worship. Worship is part of our identity, church. We come up that hill out of our lives and we proclaim who we are, not just to each other, but to ourselves and then to a world. We're not going to act like everybody else. We're not going to believe just whatever, but we're going to believe what Scripture says. And so we, we, have, we set up this wall. Second is the wall of fellowship. I need to define myself in relation to somebody else. We share a common identity and we reinforce it and hold each other accountable. The one comment that was most amazing to me going around visiting people with porch visits were, were people that saying, listen, we've done the worship at home, but it's kind of random when we do it on Sunday. What I've missed is the accountability of the fellowship. It's so easy to lose that and then think, well, I didn't quite live up the... But that's no big deal. Nobody noticed. It doesn't matter to anybody. It does matter. It matters to every one of us that each other be faithful. There's a wall of fellowship and there's a third thing, and that's a wall of morality, the way we live. We have a different ethic for how we live. And Nehemiah talks about that. And 
about intermarriage and about speaking the language of faith and making sure our words matter. The concerns of God as they returned to the land were restore the worship, repent and recommit to the covenant, and raise up the wall to secure yourself. Because right now we're just kind of out there scattered. We need some self-definition. And then the great summary of it all, the book of Malachi, when he comes along and he just, he basically rehearses all these issues, but he gives them one other thing. The law, the great and awesome day of the Lord is ahead of us. Keep that in your mind. And that's what we need to keep in mind too. The great motivation for why bother with worship and why bother with repentance and recommitment and why bother with, bother with the walls is the great and awesome day of the Lord is ahead. And the only way to be ready for that is to honor these things that God asks of us. As we get ready to do our return, let's set our hearts also on the return of Christ and realize that is the most compelling and important reason to be bothering with all of this. We want to be faithful. We want to be God's people. We want to be ready for when He returns. And we need to get ready as we do as well, returning to some sort of normalcy. Next week, I won't be here on Friday. I'll be here on Sunday. And I hope if you can at all, you be here too. And let me give one last appeal. I'll make it again next week. There are some that are not comfortable with doing so. And that's fine. I don't care what the reason is. That's fine. Do not judge the ones who are. And the ones who do come back, don't judge the ones who don't. I feel a polarization even within the church of some people who, who take this very seriously and they're very concerned about it and they, bec they become judgmental of the people who aren't as much. And then on the other side of the people who aren't as much, looking at the others as if for some reason... Something's wrong with them. Do not look down on anybody for the decision they make. But if you can be here, you feel safe to be here, be here. I'll be here with you. But until then, keep safe. We're glad that you were with us today. We appreciate you tuning in and being with us at the Valley View Church of Christ website. Um, before we have our shepherd's prayer, I just wanted to make mention, uh, one of our members uh, has now has COVID-19, Dana Lands, And Dana works at St. Bernard's Hospital. And uh, she was exposed to this and uh, she was tested positive for this. And uh, I talked to her and asked her, could we remember her in prayers? Dana said that she would like for the congregation to know a couple of things about this. Uh, she said that First of all, her symptoms are pretty mild as far as that goes. She's uh, fairly comfortable. But she did stress that uh, her symptoms started out um, with some pain and discomfort. Um, and then she had some low fever, but never high fever. And uh, she said that she would advise for you, if you have symptoms, uh, to go ahead and have those checked out. The tests are available now. And don't risk uh, exposing others if you feel like that there's any way that you might have this. And uh, again, she's doing well at home and uh, she's already feeling better and on the mend. And uh, that's a good thing. But uh, she just wanted you to know that uh, be careful and be thoughtful of others as you go into the next few days. We also want to remember the others that are part of our congregation and even those that are not a part of our congregation, but those who are dealing in health care and seeing this every day, uh, we pray for their safety. Would you bow with me, please? Our most gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for this day that you've given us. Father, we thank you for the time that we've been together and we thank you for the communion and the fellowship that we share. And Father, we look forward to a day that we can be in one another's presence again. Father, we are mindful of those who are struggling at this time. And Father, we pray for Dana Lands, and we are thankful that uh, she has had mild symptoms. But Father, we pray for her continued uh, recovery, and we pray that uh, she will have no more ill effects from this and that none of her family will suffer from this, that she will expose no one else to this, and that she'll have the peace of mind of knowing that she hasn't passed this along. Father, we pray for others that 
that are in the healthcare uh, industry. And Father, we pray for their safety and we pray uh, for their success as they deal with those who are struggling with this illness. And Father, we just ask your blessing upon them at this time. Father, we pray again for the family of Gail Holder. We pray for the family of John Pruitt. And we pray for these, these men who have lived their life in your service who are now in hospice care. We ask that you would continue to bless them and bless them with comfort and peace. And Father, continue to bless them with a strong faith as they've shown all through their lives. Be with their families. Father, we pray for John Singleton and we're thankful for the fact that he's home. Uh, we're thankful for the fact that he is getting healthier and we ask that you continue to bless him and the struggles he's had with kidney failure and we ask that he even improve in a greater way. Father, we pray for Miss Doris Nichols. We ask that you bless her and her husband and their struggles. Father, we pray for Miss Ann Dawson. We're thankful that she's now home. We ask that you help her in the, her continued recovery. Father, we pray for Miss Brenda Sharp and we're thankful for the surgery that went well. Father, we're thankful that she's feeling better and we ask that you bless her during the uh, treatments of chemo that she'll be undergoing. Father, we pray for Hansel Hall. We ask that you comfort him and bless him help him to recover and help him to get over some of the uh, pain that he is under at this time. Father, we pray for Iris Swindle and uh, we ask that you bless her in the upcoming uh, possibility of surgery. We ask that you watch over that situation and we're thankful that our grandson, Brett, is doing better at this time. Father, we pray for the family of Gerald Henry who passed away this week and many of his family are a part of our family here at Valley View and we ask that you bless each and every one. Father, we Again, are thankful for the time that we've been together today. Father, we pray that you will continue to be with your church worldwide, be with those missionaries that are overseas and, and working even today. Father, strengthen them and hold their hands up and help us to do what we can to help them. And Father, we, uh, we just ask that you would continue to bless this congregation with good health in the days ahead and help us as we come back together and try to re restore some form of normalcy uh, to our worship. And Father, uh, forgive us when we fail you in Christ's name. Amen.